Hello, everybody. I am Sofia Fadidou, a PhD candidate at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and a Marie Curie ITN Fellow at RISE. Today, I'm going to talk to, to you about ubiquitous computing for well-being and specifically about machine learning fairness within the context of ubiquitous computing. But why ubiquitous computing? Well, today, a large portion of the population is ubiquitously connected by smartphones and wearables, which continuously collect data with regard to their behavior. Especially when it comes to wearables, more than 1 billion connected wearable devices existed worldwide in 2022, while one in five Americans used wearable devices in 2021, according to conservative estimates. Some experts have called this transitional era as the era of digital phenotyping. Inspired by the biological phenotype, this, is, this era is characterized by the moment-by-moment -moment quantification of the individual level human phenotype or behavior using data from personal digital devices, such as smartphones or wearables. With the possibilities of this new era is what my research uh, revolves around. Specifically, I study the era of digital phenotyping from difficult di different dimensions, including human-computer interaction, user studies, machine learning, and fairness, in the context always of ubiquitous computing for well-being. However, in this talk, we are going to focus on machine learning and fairness when it comes to ubiquitous computing for well-being. Let me give you a brief history of fairness in the computer science domain. In summary, up until 2017, fairness was considered something like a nice-to-have feature. However, after some high-profile research, as well as real-life examples of unfair AI systems, the domain of fairness has gained increased attention. Domains like natural language processing, or computer vision, have a very active work community working on machine learning fairness. However, when it comes to ubiquitous computing and digital biomarkers, fairness is still a 404. That's why, inspired by the responsible AI movement, I have been wondering where does fairness fit when it comes to ubiquitous devices, which have evolved from an expensive toy, if I may say, to complicated devices incorporating medical functionality. Think about it for a minute. A few years ago, your smartwatch could only track your steps, possibly your sleep. However, today it can detect crashes and falls. It can detect AFib attacks or even your fertility days. And even though domains related to ubiquitous computing, such as healthcare analytics, are proven to be susceptible to biases, the Ubicom community has simply not caught up. Now, beyond scientific importance, what's the business value behind fairness? First and foremost, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights deems any discrimination on any ground, such as sex, race, or religion, prohibited. Additionally, an increasing number of companies introduce responsible AI policies on how to implement various aspects of responsible AI, such as fairness, in their operations. But still, that surely doesn't add any business value then maybe this slide will make you think twice. Unfair AI scandals have already caused significant reputation damage to involved parties. For example, an unfair fraud detection algorithm behind the Dutch child benefit scandal had led a democratically elected EU government to resign due to its long-standing detrimental effects to parts of the population. And if you are still not persuaded, the AI Act is a proposed European regulation on artificial intelligence aiming at prohibited, unaccep prohibiting unacceptable risk systems and regulating high-risk applications. Of course, the regulation itself is not specific to ubiquitous applications and ubiquitous computing, but it does categorize medical device instruments and software as high-risk. What does this mean for the ubiquitous computing domain? For example, a mobile app used to assess skin lesions intended to provide a risk estimate for cancer based on image would now require a risk assessment plan, including a fairness assessment, with regard to its potential outcomes across demographics. 
Motivated by all the above, we have drafted a set of research questions to drive our research. Firstly, how do diverse notions of fairness translate into the ubiquitous computing domain? Secondly, are data originating from ubiquitous computing systems susceptible to biases? And thirdly, can common modeling choices in ubiquitous computing literature amplify pre-existing biases? To provide answers to these questions, we follow the seven-stage framework of Suresh and Gutag, which discusses sources of harm in the machine learning life cycle. Based on this framework, we assess the biases included both in digital biomarkers, data, and models, with the goals of raising awareness in the community and providing solutions in future work based on the identified challenges. Let me note here that it's the first time that data from wearable devices are assessed with regard to biases they might incorporate. Now, I won't explain each stage here in detail because we are going to discuss them in detail in the slides to follow. To understand the sources of harm in the ubiquitous machine learning lifecycle, we adopt a relevant use case to enable our analysis. We study the largest open data set today, including heterogeneous wearable data collected in the wild from thousands of users, the My Heart Counts dataset. Our task is to predict future, future, future physical activity, an indicative but very useful use case for empowering personalized goal setting and personal training. Our dataset contains a variety of sensitive attributes, including demo demographics, clinical characteristics, and health conditions. And now it's time we gave some answers to our research questions. So how do diverse notions of fairness translate into the ubiquitous computing domain? Quantitative fields, such as computer science, view fairness as a mathematical problem of equal or equitable allocation, representation, or error rates for a particular task. Under this definition, machine learning research has broadly grouped fairness into categories, individual and group fairness. We look into group fairness, which is interested in equal or equitable allocation across user groups rather than individual users. But fairness is an extremely subjective and multifaceted notion, and even within group fairness, we have diverging viewpoints. We have the we are all equal viewpoint, which assumes that all user groups have equal ability with regards to the problem at hand. The what you see is what you get which assumes that each user gr group has different capabilities with regards to the problem at hand, and hence differences in outcomes are expected. And then we have the hybrid viewpoint, which is essentially somewhere in between. Each viewpoint is also characterized and quantified by certain fairness metrics. Unfortunately, hybrid metrics are susceptible to data imbalances, which make it difficult to use in an objective way in our use case. So we adopt the we are all equal viewpoint metrics as the what you see is what you get viewpoint has been criticized for propagating historic biases. Specifically, we utilize the disparate impact ratio metric, which looks into the differences in positive outcomes received by the unprivileged versus the privileged user group. In our use case, it could be interpreted as how many users receive high activity goals, a positive outcome you may say, in the unprivileged group compared to the privileged group. A disparate impact ratio lower than one indicates bias against the unprivileged group, while higher than one bias in favor of the unprivileged group. A disparate imp uh, impact ratio of one indicates statistical parity. Let's take this example. Uh, let's assume we have six users in the unprivileged group receiving high activity goals, or 60%, and seven users in the privileged group receiving high activity goals. That would give us a disparate impact ratio of 60 divided by 70 equals 0 0.86. This is lower th than one, which means that the privileged group is favored over the unprivileged group by the algorithm. Now, are data originating from ubiquitous computing systems susceptible to biases? First, historical bias. Historical biases occur even if the data are flawlessly measured and sampled by reflecting real-world past and present biases against one or more groups of people. 
In our use case, historical bias emerges due to inequalities in physical activity and the existence of the digital divide. In other words, the World Health Organization reports that certain population groups, such as women, older adults, or people with disabilities and chronic diseases, tend to be less physically active. Naturally, this reality is going to be captured in a ubiquitous computing dataset as well. When it comes to the digital divide, wearables are still a niche device, as they require a certain level of technical skills and financial comfort, while almost half the world's population, the majority of them women or citizens of the developing countries, are still disconnected. Another interesting point reported is the lead in the literature is that bring your own device type of studies, which is often the case in large scale datasets in the Ubicom community, significantly suffer from demographic disparities, especially regarding race. Second, representation bias. Representation biases occur when sampling methods lead to underrepresenting general population segments. In our use case, we compare the population group ratios between the data set in green and the real world in pink. We notice significantly misrepresented groups in terms of race, gender, age, hypertension, and BMI. For example, in the real world, you expect one woman per one man, approximately a 50-50 ratio. However, in the My Heart Counts dataset, we find only 0.2 women per one man. Generally, older, white, and fit males are significantly overrepresented in the dataset. On the other hand, PI datasets can still include underrepresented groups, if even if sampled perfectly. For example, people with heart condition or joint issues are properly represented in the dataset compared to the real world. However, they are still a minority group naturally, leading to data imbalances that should be acknowledged. Finally, even if sampling is representative and equal, the data, the data set can still suffer from representation bias if the sampling method is limited or uneven. What does this mean? Let's say we have a data set of 50-50 males and females, but we somehow select very fit male participants, whereas we select sedentary female ones. This will create representation bias in our labels to be used for training. This is indeed the case with the My Heart Counts dataset, as people with diabetes or joint issues, females and non-white participants appear to be significantly less active in the data. Third, measurement bias. Measurement biases occur when there are collection or measurement error discrepancies across groups. In an analysis of the model recency owned by our participants in the data, we see that females and people with normal BMI tend to own older and cheaper phones with fewer human activity recognition capabilities and lower accuracy, possibly creating measurement discrepancies and thus bias across group. This is still an assumption that needs to be tested, but there are differences in measurement instruments across groups. Finally, can common modeling choices in the ubiquitous computing literature amplify pre-existing data biases? In the fourth stage, we move to aggregation bias. Aggregation biases occur when a one-size-fits-all model is used for data in which underlying user groups should be treated separately. To test for such biases in our use case, we use the state-of-the-art model in physical activity prediction, a three-layer LSTM model, suggested in prior work. We initially compare two types of models, aware models, which include sensitive attributes in their feature set, and unaware models, which do not include sensitive attributes in their feature set. And in principle, they shouldn't be biased against certain groups. In the diagram, you see that uh, the sensitive attributes in the x-axis and the disparate impact ratio value in the y-axis. I remind you that a disparate impact ratio value of one is considered optimal and anything within the pink range is considered fair. We can see that the aware models in pink propagate or even amplify data biases in green across many attributes. And even the unaware models in purple are also not foolproof against data biases due to the existence of proxy features. The orange bar refers to the personalized models, which are trained per user group or per demographic, which we discuss in the next slide. 
In the fifth stage, learn, learning biases occur when modeling choices amplify performance disparities across different user segments in the data. We exploit, we exploit personalization as a modeling choice, which has been praised in the ubiquitous computing literature for its superior performance. The concept behind personalization is that you can fine tune a generic model based on user group data to achieve better performance for each group. I won't go into more details due to time constraints, but the important thing to notice is that this fine-tuning process actually amplifies data biases that exist in the user group data. As you can see here, the orange plots tend to be further away, the orange bars tend to be further away from the optimal value compared to the pink and purple bars. <laughs> For example, in our use case, the personalized model would give all users with diabetes, regardless of whether they were physically active or not, low activity goals, just because of the pre-existing imbalances in the data set. In the sixth stage, evaluation biases occur when the benchmark population is not representative of the real user population. To test for evaluation biases in our use case, given the lack of benchmarks in the domain, we created a synthetic benchmark that represents the perfect world. We noticed that um, we noticed then that this perfect benchmark in solid lines tend to tends to hide imperfections in the trained models, whereas the original random test set benchmarks in dust lines show the real picture on the target population, highlighting the importance of proper evaluation and representative evaluation. In simpler words, it's not very difficult to hide, to hide the truth of unfairness. Finally, in the seventh stage, deployment biases occur when there exists a mismatch between the problem a model is designed to solve and how it is actually utilized. For example, in research, but also industry, oftentimes models are built and evaluated as if fully autonomous. In reality, they operate in a complex, complex socio-ethical system. What about human biases, for example? physicians, well-documented confirmation bias towards AI, etc. So the key takeaways from this presentation that I want you to keep is that we showcase for the first time that ubiquitous computing data and models can suffer from diverse biases across all stages of the machine learning lifecycle. We also saw that ubiquitous datasets suffer from misrepresented, underrepresented, and unevenly sampled populations due to historical and representation biases. Unaware machine learning models are not foolproof against biases, according to our experimentation, but propagate biases inherent in digital biomarkers data. More importantly, design choices such as personalization can lead to personalized ML models that can significantly harm fairness unless special care is given to balancing training data. And finally, misleading evaluation metrics, benchmarks and processes can hide fairness issues. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you found this presentation useful.